right, welcome everyone to another Rafael Medina subspecialty virtual morning report. Um, for everybody who hasn't met me before, my name is Alex Smith. Uh, I am a chief resident at Northville Health at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine uh, at the North Shore and LIJ campuses. And I am so happy today to be able to introduce two of my colleagues from my home institution who are gonna be uh, presenting a case and leading a discussion today. Um, so, uh, Dr. Dimple Shah and Dr. Mangala Narasimhan, is, is it okay if I read out your introductions to everybody? Yeah, sure. All right. You don't have so, to do a whole long introduction. You really don't. <laughs> I, I won't. Don't worry. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Mangala Narasimhan, um, she is going to be our discussant today, and she is our uh, Director of Critical Care Services at Northwell Health, and she has been a and attending at our institution for over 14 years. Um, and uh, on a personal note, I'll say that she's been a fantastic mentor both to, to me and to, I'm sure to Dr. Shah and to, to several of our colleagues. And Dr. Dimple Shah, I'm so happy to say was, was my chief resident just a few years ago when I was an intern. Uh, she did her residency and now her uh, then her chief residency fellowship, chief fellowship all, all at uh, the Zucker School of Medicine in Northwell Health. Um, and she's gonna be our case presenter for today. So now that I've introduced you guys to everybody, maybe the first thing I'll ask you guys is to each of you to share why you chose pulmonary and critical care medicine as a field and why uh, you think it might be an exciting option for some of the people on the line. And then maybe just to share a hobby or interest outside of medicine. Dimple, you wanna go first? Go ahead. Uh, sure. So hi everyone, my name is Dimple, third year um, pulmonary critical care fellow. So I chose uh, pulmonary critical care for a couple of reasons. Um, first, um, I really like the kind of management that we did in the ICU. I think I was initially torn between cardiology and pulmonary critical care, um, and then eventually learned that I really just like the critical care aspect of it. Um, I like kind of the dynamic management of patients, um, seeing things in real time um, is really great. And I will say that um, a lot of why I went into pulmonary critical care is because of the mentorship that I got from um, a lot of our like acclaimed critical care attendings and Mangala being one of them, one of my first attendings ever as an intern. Um, and that left a mark for many years to come. And I am lucky enough to be able to work with her, which is amazing. Um, outside, of, um, outside of work, I have two little girls. So I spend a lot of time with them. Um, I spend a lot of time playing with them and warning them off each other. So it's really fun. Um, and I like dancing and reading and eating um, when I do get the chance to do any of those things. Um, I have been a pulmonary critical care attending now for about 17 years. Uh, I, and I really struggled with my decision of pulmonary versus, I mean, medicine versus surgery. I liked the procedure aspects. I liked, um, you know, having immediate grat gratification of, of taking care of patients and seeing what the outcome is. Um, I didn't like the fact that in surgery, you're sort of trapped for many hours and it's a little more unpredictable. Um, so I chose to do medicine. And then in medicine, I, I really came across wonderful mentors um, who really drew, drew me to pulmonary and critical care um, I, you know, from the very beginning of my internship. And I, I sort of like to take care of the sickest patients in the hospital. I like trying to figure out what's going on. And I like the fact that in a few days, you either could make somebody better or you could not make them better, but either way you had some closure um, and you knew what was gonna happen to them. And I found that to be very appealing um, rather than taking care of somebody for many years and not knowing you know, how things were gonna turn out. So I this was more my cup of tea and, and, and really just, it was really the people that I met along the way, I would say it really drew me to it. The way they thought and the way they interacted with families really was uh, attractive. Um, what I do outside of the hospital, I have uh, two kids also, and I have uh, a dog, and I have uh, my dad who lives with me, and I like to walk, I like to read, um, I do a lot of teaching through chest and through um, other things, I'm so busy with stuff like that as well, so, um, you know, lots of, uh, of things, I love to travel, um, so these are the things that I like to do outside of the hospital, um, and really try to turn off as much as I can when I can. Thank you so much, guys. Um, so I don't know I, who's leading the, the whiteboard today and typing up the teaching points. Perfect. And then as soon as we get the whiteboard board up, uh, Dimple, whenever you're ready, feel free to share the fir first aliquot of the case. 
Sorry, Dimple, I think you're, I think you're muted. Yes, that would help. Um, all right, so let's get started. So we have a 34-year-old female um, who is 16 weeks pregnant, presenting with shortness of breath. Um, she says that she's been having some progressive dyspnea on exertion for about three months. Um, she noticed that even small activities such as uh, pushing her older child's stroller or walking up the stairs is causing, him, causing her some difficulty with breathing. I think one of the turning points was a few days ago, she was in Atlantic City and she noticed that even just walking around on the boardwalk, which she was able to do a couple of days ago, um, she became very, very short of breath and thought that she may have had COVID. And so she wanted to get evaluated um, for those symptoms. She ended up going to urgent care where they swabbed her for COVID and she tested negative. Um, however, her oxygen was a little bit lower at 95%. So they advised her to go to the emergency room. And that is how we became involved in her care. So Dibble, you would say the shortness of breath um, is, is um, co correlating with the, her pregnancy time at this point? Um, yes, it seems that she's she's now 16 weeks, so about four months, and she yeah. noticed that it's been getting worse for about, um, yeah, yeah, three months, yeah. So no problems with the prior pregnancy that she had, and she didn't feel this way after the first baby was born. Right, so in her during her last pregnancy, she said that uh, up until she gave birth, she was fine. In the postpartum period, however, she did become a little hypoxic. And she reported that it was because she had fluid on her lungs. They gave her some diuretic, she believes, and she got better and went home after 48 hours after giving birth. Okay, and that's all we know about that time period. Yeah, that's it. Otherwise, um, no eventful um, occurrences during that pregnancy. So past medical history, anything that we should know about, anything that she has? So the only past medical history she carries is she has a history of latent TB um, that she was treated at age four. She doesn't really remember any more information about that or how or why she was exposed, um, but remembers or knows that she received INH for latent TB. Okay. So maybe, before we jump into a little bit more of the history, maybe a uh... Maybe Mangal and Dimble, can you guys talk us through a little bit how the, I know you mentioned a little bit about this patient's pregnancy and her previous pregnancy, uh, maybe for some of our earlier learners on the line, how that, how that affects your, the, um, the, how you're thinking about this patient's case and your, and your clinical reasoning about, about her, or if it, if it changes anything at all at this point, and if so, how? Yep. I'm always concerned um, if this was correlating with her pregnancy now, you know, does this something that is um, related to the fact that she is pregnant. So we know that in pregnancy, there are certain things that we are concerned about. Um, we're concerned about DVTs. We're concerned about um, um, some autoimmune diseases that will flare up during pregnancy as well. So uh, the fact that she had another baby, uh, my, my, my questions were, you know, did this happen when she was pregnant the last time, or is this something unique to this pregnancy? And now that she's told me that after she had the last baby that she was really short of breath and need, had water on her lungs, whatever that means, um, that makes me concerned that there was some um, something to do with that first pregnancy that did she have a cardiomyopathy with pulmonary edema? Did she have um, chronic PEs and DVTs that's causing her to have um, you know chron chronic thrombophlebotic disease? Um, or is this... Uh, um, Sometimes we see cancers that are um, hormone receptor, you know, positive that flare up during a pregnancy and then are, are slowly getting worse from that point on. So, you know, those are the sort of the things that I'm thinking about when you're telling me this 34 year old who was dismissed after the last pregnancy then seemed to get better and now is worse again. Um, those are sort of the, the thoughts that I have now. There's lots of other things that we need to worry about her environment. You know, her medical history besides this, uh, I, you know, is she taking any medications right now that are going to be uh, related to this? So we have to work on what else is going on um, that could be related. But those are the top things that I'm worried about. Is it something that is um, the ones that, that I've described already? 
So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So you said latent TB that she was treated for. Do you know um, uh, what medications she is on now? Anything? So right now, the only medications she takes are prenatal vitamins. Okay. And her family, do we know if there's any um, lung diseases or other family history, cancers? No lung disease in the family. Um, she denies any cancer history in the family, just some hypertension in her father. Okay. Um, uh, and her first baby was born healthy and has no um, med medical issues as far as we know? Correct. Uh, yeah, the first baby was born healthy at 39 weeks. Um, he's about two and a half at the time that she came to see us and no, no, no known medical problems at the time. And do we know if she has a, a prior history of uh, miscarriages or anything else? No, she says no prior history of miscarriages. And I, I'm asking about that because we know that things like lupus anticoagulant and other um, autoimmune diseases present with a history of miscarriages um, and really sometimes nothing else. So looking for some autoimmune related things um, with a, a miscarriage history. Um, do we know her social history? Does she smoke? So she doesn't smoke um, prior to pregnancy. She drank socially. Um, she's currently not working. She's living at home, taking care of her kid. Um, and really that's that's about it. I think and exactly. Do, her do we know history. if anyone in the home smokes? Or... Nobody in the home smokes, no. Okay. And do we know anything about uh, any environmental things? Does she have any pets? She does not have any pets, um, no known exposures, born here in New York, um, and uh, that's about it, no other environmental. Okay, and, and anything about cats or exposure to like, like does she feed the pigeons outside her window or anything crazy like that? Um, Honestly, I, I don't know. I didn't ask okay. her about that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I'm worried about uh, some I'm sort of um, uh, autoimmune, again, uh, disease or some sort of environmental toxin like toxoplasmosis, um, other things that pregnant women tend to get um, from handling, you know, cats or cat feces um, or anything like that. So I'm just asking about, uh, and, and then there's lots of lung diseases that we get from birds. Um, so just concerned, just want to see if she has exposure to any of those things that would be progressive, sort of like this hypersensitivity pneumonitis and, and things along that line, um, as well. Yeah. No, no, um, like domicile bird exposure in her house. Um, okay. Yeah. And travel, do we know if she's gone anywhere? Um, not recently, maybe before her first kid. Um, but the only travel she had was to Atlantic city that was via car. Um, they did not have any stops during that time, and it was about three and a half, four hour car ride. Okay, so you're um, leading me down like a long car ride causing a DVT, but three and a half hours, although she's pregnant, um, would not be considered to be a super long um, right. exposure to, to not moving for a long period of time. Um, any allergies to anything? No allergies. Okay. Okay, so really just progressive dyspnea with nothing else. Do we have any, um, I guess we'll get to imaging in a minute. You'll tell me her vitals and then we'll go, we'll go to imaging um, for after that. Um, so I can move on to vitals. Mm -hmm. So when she came into the hospital, uh, she's afebrile 98.8. Um, heart rate is 100. Blood pressure is 123 over 86. She's breathing at a rate of 24 and she's saturating 95%. On room air. On room air. Okay. In regards to her physical exam, she overall appears well. Um, she's uh, speaking comfortably in full sentences. She has no icterus. She does not have any um, um, cervical lymphadenopathy, she, her heart sounds, so she's tachycardic at 100, but otherwise regular rate and rhythm, or regular rhythm rather. Um, pulmonary wise, she's got a few crackles that we hear um, at the bilateral bases. Abdominal exam, um, she has a palpable uterus that's below her umbilicus. Neuro exam, she's alert, she's oriented. Uh, no focal deficits, 
and she has no lower extremity edema and no obvious rash. Um, in terms of her um, BMI, I know that's something that we're not really looking at specifically, mm -hmm. but are we like in the normal range or like a very abnormal range or do anything at she's, all? Her, her BMI is about 32. Okay. Um, so and again, I think in pregnancy that, you know, that doesn't really mean what we think it means. I just want to know sort of how abnormal yeah. is it? So it's not really super abnormal. Not super abnormal. She's a little bit heavier set. Um, her neck girth is a little bit larger. Um, but otherwise, I mean, that, yeah. Okay. So what you're telling me is that she's a little bit tachycardic. You don't really hear any murmurs or any rubs or anything that would concern you in her heart exam. Um, her blood pressure is not out of, of, in a very high range or a very low mm -hmm. range where at low range, I'd be concerned more about a, a big, you know, RV or PE. And in a very high range, I would be concerned about things like, you know, preeclampsia or something else that would be causing her to be short of breath. So blood pressure doesn't really give me that information. Her respiratory rate is high, but we know in pregnancy, you can have a slightly higher respiratory rate. This is probably out of range, especially since she's not that pregnant at this point where her, uh, you know, her lung volumes are not changed and, you know, or anything like that. So we're not in third trimester yet. So there's no explanation for her increased respiratory rate. Um, and uh, you're telling me that she has crackles at, at both bases, which we're a little bit concerned about now, again, if she were later in the pregnancy, <clears throat> you could have some atelectasis at the bases, but um, this is different and, and, and crackles. So definitely concerning um, as well. And no rash, no nothing on her skin that you're seeing as well. No icteric sclera and no pain or complaints of, of any discomfort anywhere. No. Okay. No rashes, no pain. Um, no real discomfort. She just says she's short of breath um, when she's trying to exert herself. Okay, um, good. And so any other questions from anyone on the physical exam? Um, there's something in the chat that I see. I don't know if we should be looking at that. Um, so I'm interested in, in, in a lot of her, her labs and imaging now, because I am looking for some clues as to what, what's happening, right? So um, we know that in her first pregnancy, she had an issue towards the end of it, but was fine through it. So I really would love to know after that first pregnancy, when she had the fluid and was there a previous echo or anything that where they looked at her, her heart in any way? No, so she did um, deliver in our hospital the first pregnancy. Mm -hmm. There's no echo. Um, there's no imaging at the time. It looks like they gave her one time IV Lasix, 20 milligrams, IV furosemide, 20 milligrams, um, and she got better and went home the next day. Hmm. There is some report um, that she was hypotensive during the time of delivery, but it's not recorded if she got um, a lot of volume resuscitation um, because our EMRs are not linked with anesthesia. So I'm not sure, but that possibly may have contributed that she got um, larger than she could handle volume. That's and her first know. pregnancy was a normal delivery. It was a vaginal delivery and not a, a, a C-section? Correct. Okay. Um, and do we know if it was like prolonged labor for like, you know, an extended period of time or anything that was out of the or, uh, a range? Um, I don't think so. She, it was definitely, it was definitely within 24 hours. Okay. Um, so I don't think anything um, out of range, although 24 okay. hours is enough, but. Okay. So I guess a urine is what I would start with. Did it show anything abnormal? Is there anything that, that would uh, clue us in one direction or another? You said urine? Yep. Um, so her urine analysis was pretty unremarkable. She had one to five white blood cells, um, but otherwise no leukocyte esterase, no blood, and no protein. Okay, good. That's helpful. Um, and So her white count, her hemoglobin, her platelets, were they in the normal range or can you tell me what they were? Sure. I can tell you the exact number. So her hemoglobin is 11.3, her white count is 9.2, and her platelets are 227. Okay. In regards to her chemistry, her sodium is 137, potassium of 
chloride of 107, bicarb of 19, BUN of 5, and creatinine of 0.46. Hmm. Her calcium is 8.8. .8. Her FOS is 3.7. Her MAG is 2.1. Um, her AST and ALT are 32 and 15. I unfortunately don't have the ALK FOS and the bilirubin is one. Albumin of... 4.0. Those labs are pretty unremarkable, right? So her hemoglobin is not super high or low. If she, if it were very low, that might also cause shortness of breath when you have severe anemia. Her platelet count's totally normal. Um, white counts in normal range as well. So that that hematology does not give me any real clues as to anything that could be wrong. Her chemistry, um, the only thing that I'm noticing is that her CO2 is a little bit low at 19. Um, so she has an NIN gap, not really, um, nothing significant. Um, and the rest of her chemistry looks absolutely normal. So not again, again not really a huge clue there. Um, yeah, I meant by carb, sorry. Um, a, a clue there as to what is going on with her as well. So unclear as to what, uh, from there, not a lot of clues. So chest x-ray, let's go for that and see how that goes. So just Temple, if I can interject for just a second before we yeah. jump ahead, the just wanted to share one or two questions from the chat and also sure. Sure. the, so it looks like somebody asked, uh, just for clarification, how long ago was the, the patient's first child born? The, so this baby's two years old, right? You said? Correct. Yes. Yeah. All right. Sounds good. And then I think we answered this already also, with the, the round of the first delivery, whether it was a C-section or a vaginal delivery. Vaginal. Yes, it was a vaginal delivery. And then uh, I know you guys said you were looking for some imaging, but before we get there, maybe based upon the, the data and the history we have so far, uh, I'd love for you, for Mangala, if you could take us through maybe a differential, any differential you have at this point um, and the, how any subsequent tests might help you work that up. Yep, I'm definitely worried about a postpartum cardiomyopathy that started on the last pregnancy and is um, sort of now coming back now again here. I'm worried about um, PEs or DVTs that are sort of chronic and, and are continuing or getting worse now with this next pregnancy that have not been treated in between. Um, and those are the two highest things on my differential right now. Other things that I would have been worried about would have been things like um, a, a, a super high blood pressure causing, you know, some sort of preeclampsia type thing, but that's not the case here at all. And the urine doesn't correlate with that either. Um, and, uh, those are the two things that are highest on my differential. And then some sort of interstitial lung disease that started when she was, you know, um, pregnant the last time and has sort of been indolent. And now that she's requiring, um, uh, um, a higher of, she, she's she's stressed a little bit. We're seeing that sort of rear its head again. So that an ILD is possible, but her age doesn't really lend me to think that that's, it's just not a normal age for someone to have an ILD. And then some oddball things like, could she have a progressive lung cancer? We're seeing young patients now with um, lung cancer with no real risk factors. And that's been sort of a, a newer thing that we're seeing. Um, so it, could this be that? Sure, less high on my differential for sure. Um, you know, obvious things being obvious would be a, a cardiomyopathy, some sort of congenital heart disease, but I would have expected her first pregnancy to be, to be more difficult than it wasn't. So that doesn't really mm -hmm. lend, lead me in that direction. Um, she didn't have symptoms until she, after she delivered the baby the last time. So that sort of goes against that as well. Um, and in infection, I wouldn't think that two years would go by that she would be fine. And now suddenly the infections back again, TB doesn't, you know, can do that. And you could have an indolent TB, um, but why it did nothing for two years, uh, that's a long period of time for TB to, to not do anything, you are sort of immunocompromised or immunosuppressed when you're pregnant. So could TB come back? Sure. But I would have expected her to have ongoing cough and low grade mm -hmm. symptoms um, for the past two years, which I'm not getting out of the story. So 
Um, the two highest things would be a chronic DVT type picture for whatever reason, um, uh, cardiomyopathy, and then maybe below that, some sort of uh, weird presentation of cancer. And I always in my in my head go through a differential of an infectious process, um, a, a cancer process versus a structural process such as a cardiomyopathy or an interstitial lung disease of some kind, um, and go through the differential in each of those categories um, to see where where this patient would fit, and then rule out things based upon what I know. Yeah, and just one one thing to add to her overall picture, um, I think, you know you. When we, when we see a lot of pregnant patients, we see that they do have some subjective dyspnea, but it's important to figure out, is this physiologic dyspnea or pathologic dyspnea? That's really important. Um, so someone who's 16 weeks pregnant, which is fairly early in pregnancy, was fine and now can't walk a couple of blocks would be pathologic dyspnea. So that's just one thing, you know, when you're first starting to um, evaluate her, you just want to figure out how worried should you be and what kind of workup you should be undergoing. And, and Dimple, no lower extremity edema whatsoever. Both sides were completely fine. Yeah. Again, going against some sort of congenital heart type of thing, you would expect to see some clubbing and some you know, uh, lower extremity edema if that were that. And right. it also sort of goes against a cardiomyopathy as well because you would also expect to see that, but still on my differential. Awesome. Um, somebody wants to know about bleeding time in INR. Do you do you? Um, I don't have a bleeding time or a clotting time, but her INR was normal. It was um either one point one or one point two. So you're showing me her chest X-ray now, or is this an old chest X-ray? No, this is her current chest X-ray. She doesn't have an old chest X-ray. Okay. Um, good. Thank you for telling me that. So I always like to go through this in a very systematic manner, either from outside in or inside out when you're reading a chest x-ray so that you don't miss obvious things because you always want to jump to the obvious thing and, and you, you'll miss other things. So if we start from the inside out, um, her heart, her first of all, the, the x-ray is not rotated, both clavicular head are pretty well centered. The spine is in the center of the film. It's a good inspirational effort. You can see if you count rib spaces that there's a, a more than seven or eight rib spaces there. So it's a good inspiration. Um, the um, uh, clavicular heads are again are even. And, and so there's not a lot of rotation. If we look at my mediastinal structures, I see both pulmonary arteries. They're not super prominent um, here, maybe slightly. And then if I look at the cardiac silhouette, it's really not impressive. It's not huge. Um, and it doesn't seem to be that enlarged at all. Um, the other thing that would be on my differential um, would be some sort of pulmonary hypertension um, that's coming back uh, with pregnancy as well. Um, that would be one more thing on my differential. Um, so if I look at my CP angles, they're super clear. Uh, I don't see any effusion whatsoever. They're both sharp. Um, and I don't see uh, any huge amount of increased markings in her lung parenchyma. There may be some in the upper lobes going out about two thirds of the way, but really nothing um, super significant. It's a pretty normal chest X-ray. And then finally, I always look at the bones to see if there's any fractures or anything else that I, I've missed. Both um, humerus look okay, the, the rib shadows look okay. Um, and I don't see any big um, evidence of any uh, structural problems with this as well. So pretty normal chest x-ray for what you're saying. Correct. And EKG, I'm not expecting anything big, but but uh, things I'd be worried about is that she in some sort of rapid AFib or an arrhythmia that's causing her to be um, short of breath as well. Can we talk about pregnancy and pulmonary hypertension? Somebody wants to know. Um, sure, you can definitely have some sort of autoimmune process during pregnancy that can cause you to have pulmonary hypertension. Pregnancy itself can cause you some people to have pulmonary hypertension, but it's not screened for at all. Um, people don't get echoes during their pregnancy unless they're complaining of something or have something that is uh, very um, uh, um, there. But 
besides the fact that you could have increased risk of DVTs causing pulmonary hypertension, um, um, increased work um, of the heart in general, um, this woman is tachycardic. So is that causing some sort of, uh, but we don't know anything about what her heart function is, but her heart did not look enlarged in that whatsoever. Her pregnancy and, high, and pulmonary hypertension can happen for for unclear reasons as well. Um, could you know you could also have some sort of PFO or something that that shows up more in pregnancy than than it would otherwise. Uh, that can uh, be a source as well. So different things that can happen that cause pulmonary hypertension during pregnancy. But I don't really see. I, we need we the next thing that I would want to do is, is an echo. But you'll tell me for EKG is okay first. Yeah, her EKG just shows them sinus tachycardia at okay. hundred. And That's no, right. like, evidence of a PE on the EKG as well? No. And do you want to go through what that would be besides tachycardia, which is the most common thing? So when you have um, a PE with EKG, sometimes you can see specific patterns. Um, so there's, like, a something called an S1, Q3, T3 pattern. Um, now, that pattern is not very specific for PE. Um, it is a pattern that you can see in patients with core pulmonale. So if you have a patient with a significant enough PE that is causing core pulmonale, um, that's a pattern that you can look out for. So basically a large S wave in lead one, um, a Q wave in lead three, and then you would see an inverted T wave um, as well in lead three. I think is that what you're uh, pointing to, Mangla? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Perfect. And again, the most common is just tachycardia um, as uh, for, for a PE in an EKG, but that's when T3, Q3, T3 is the one they love to test about and ask yeah. about. And mm -hmm. then evidence of right heart strain with, you know, any evidence of right heart strain on the EKG as well. Yeah. Um, the Someone asked in the chat about um, asthma. Um, could this be mm -hmm. an exacerbation of her underlying asthma? I would expect if she's short of breath and her saturation is 95% and she's breathing at 24, that on her lung exam, you would hear some wheezing um, or so, you know, some evidence of decreased lung, uh, a decreased uh, breath sounds, you know, bilaterally with decreased air motion. And I'm not, I didn't get that from you at all. So that would take asthma off my, my differential because it really, you would expect to see in someone who's this symptomatic, some, you would expect to hear, um, evidence of, of, uh, obstructive lung disease. And I don't, I, I didn't get that from you. Yeah, no, she didn't have any wheezing and no history of asthma. Uh, but you can definitely get asthma exacerbation um, in pregnancy. And sometimes in young patients, it can be their initial presentation of asthma as well. So, um, And we treat it if, it, it if they were not pregnant, like you treat the asthma because the hypoxemia is worse for the the baby than, than no hypoxemia. So we treat yeah. them with steroids and with bronchodilators the way that we would otherwise. Absolutely. So somebody wants to know what the differential is, is bilateral crackle. So I was going to ask you for an ultrasound. Do we have an ultrasound? Um, we have an ultrasound, um, and she is actually A-line predominant bilaterally, anteriorly. All the way down? All the way down, hmm. and in the mid-axillary regions as well, and no um, photo effusion, nothing above the diaphragm. So you're telling me she has normal A-line pattern with lung sliding everywhere? Correct. So there, there, the crackles are... are not significant, whatever they are. Somebody's hearing crackles, but they're really not. Uh, I mean, the only thing I would say is, could this be early, early interstitial lung disease? But even then, you would expect to start to see some abnormalities on your pocus, some B lines, um, you know, at the base or where you're hearing the crackles, um, because the pleura would be changed somehow if she was enough. If it was enough for her to be short of breath with a decreasing saturation. I would not expect to see A-line pattern um, bilaterally. So if I see A-line pattern bilaterally in someone who's short of breath and desaturating, my concern again is a PE, um, number one, um, and a shunt of some kind, number two, um, causing her to, to feel this way. So those are the two things that are highest on my differential now. Before we jump into the, the next portion of the case simple, so it looks like um, somebody in the chat is asking about the the TB history and if there was any additional testing done to try to clarify whether this patient could have had rea reactivation TB. So again, um, so, yeah, sorry, go yeah, ahead, Dr. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, so she doesn't really have any symptoms um, that are 
correlating with the reactivation of TB, like B symptoms, like fever, night sweats, weight loss. Um, she doesn't really have any x-ray evidence of any cavitary lesion. Um, and so the TB workup was not pursued further. Um, she was treated- She had the normal with, chest yeah. x-ray and normal ultrasound with A-line patterns. So not even like she has like lung disease at all from the, you would always expect it to somehow affect the pleura uh, in some way. Um, so, and, and again, no symptoms of, of reactivation TB, not even a cough really. So, so goes against that, um, you know, and then you worry, did the INH do something, but if it did, you would expect to see something on her x-ray, which you're not seeing either. Yeah. Thanks so much, guys. What'd you guys do next, Bibble? Um, so I can give you the echo next. Yay, fun. Um, <laughs> uh, so the echo is showing that she has normal LV function, um, normal chamber sizes, mm -hmm. and no evidence of pulmonary hypertension or valvular disease. Bubble study? Is negative. Okay. Just RV? To... I'm sorry? RV function and size is normal? It's normal. Yes, normal. So no evidence of a shunt, um, no evidence of a big PE either, right? Because you would expect yeah. her RV to be affected in some way by that. Although, you know, she could have smaller chronic PEs, but um, <clears throat> her RV is not affected by that um, yet. Um, so still on my differential, but yeah. I could take the shunt off my differential, I guess, um, at this point with a, a negative bubble study. Hmm. So, so then what, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. So the, um, so one thing that wasn't initially done, which we ended up doing once we saw the patient is, um, we ambulated her, uh, to see how dystonic is she and if she becomes hypoxemic and after walking about hundred feet, she dropped her saturation to 87%. Okay, so that tells us that the increased demand is causing her to drop her saturation, right? So yes. it could happen in a few different types of diseases. Again, in interstitial lung disease, we see that, right? And mm -hmm. in um, but, but it, this would have to be very early interstitial lung disease because her X-ray, her 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 focus all don't go along with that. Um, Something like PCP pneumonia could cause that. That's like classic description of PCP pneumonia. But again, not presenting with fever, cough, right. or any of the things that, that, or any risk factors for that, um, that, that would lead me in the direction of PCP pneumonia. Um, do you have an HIV test? Uh, yes, it's negative. HIV is negative. Yeah, we did do an HIV test. Yeah, because yeah. HIV could relate to pulmonary hypertension and other things. Um, Absolutely. Um, hmm, now her saturation's dropping with walking. Yes. No shunt. Do we have, did you do a CAT scan? So we did end up doing a CAT scan on her. Yes. Okay. Um, and just before we get that, just one one point is, um, you know, even later in pregnancy, even if uh, patients are more dysthmic and hyperventilating, um, normally your maternal oxygenation is preserved. Uh, so when a patient does desaturate, that's pretty much always abnormal. So that's one thing to. And the other thing I would add to my my differential now would be something like a pulmonary venal occlus occlusive disease, um, which could cause this type of a pattern with a normal chest X-ray. Um, and um, I don't know why a shunt would open up as she walks. It's possible, um, but some sort of um, pulmonary process where you would have a, a um, more dyspnea with exertion than you would without. So, but then, you know, you would repeat a bubble study and just see if there, it, it happened after four or five beats versus mm -hmm. one beat um, to see if there's any, any uh, relation to some sort of weird um, physiology through the liver as well, um, causing that. Yeah. yeah. And, and exercise with repeat bubble study would, would help you with that. All right. CAT scan. 
and maybe AVMs also might be able might do this as well. That would be one one other thing. Wow. See, you could not see this on her chest X-ray. Wow. Yeah. And this would make sense, right? So this now makes me think of something like LAM, right? So you can see uh, cystic lung disease bilaterally all the way from the top of the lungs down to the bottom. Um, and uh, her age and the fact that it got worse for pregnancy with estrogen um, causing smooth muscle receptor, um, which is what activates LAM. Um, this would be the, that would be top of my differential now based upon this. Yes, we too were very surprised to see this CAT scan. Yeah. Um, given the fact that her chest x-ray looked largely clear. Yeah. Um, you know, when we looked at it again, now that we knew what the CAT scan looked like, then you can postulate that there might be some more interstitial markings, but really um, it was a pretty normal CAT scan. I mean, pretty normal chest x-ray. Yeah, it really was. Yeah. Huh. So how would we diagnose LAM is the question next. And what, what test would you do based upon this? My suspicion would be really high. What else could this possibly be? Um, is, it would be the question. I'm no longer seeing my screen. I'm sorry. I'm trying to find you guys on my, on my desktop now because um, I've lost you. But I will find you again in a second. Um, <laughs> Okay, I found you. Um, so the someone wants to clarify what uh, what we see on the on the CAT scans. So if you could pull it back up, you can see the normal prank, per, lung parenchyma is really um, the spaces the darker the the darker circles are cysts, and they're all throughout the lungs, anterior, posterior, um, all the way from the top to the to the the apices down to the bases of the lungs. Um, uh, these are just these small cysts. They're different sizes. Um, they're all over. They're not just in the periphery. They're they're sort of everywhere through the lungs. Um, and LEM is activated. It's a smooth muscle receptor um, disease that uh, um, you can. This is exactly the pattern that it looks like. Um, so this would be my in her age group the number one thing in a non smoker. Um, what I would be concerned about. So my differential diagnosis for cystic lesions would be something like um, cystic fibrosis, but you would have had symptoms, more symptoms, more cough, more phlegm, you know, things like that. Um, you would have other symptoms of uh, cystic fibrosis, such as uh, they're sometimes infertile, they're sometimes um, have sinus disease, they have um, biliary disease as well. So lots of other things that come along with cystic fibrosis, as we know, um, which could also look like this, but Usually it's it's groups of cysts. They call it a bunch of grapes rather than um, completely throughout the lungs, pretty evenly like this. Um, and so this this pattern, I, it, it, it screams out lamb in, in, in this age group. So um, the workup would be um, an S100, uh, right? You sent, you sent markers? Yeah, so um, we sent, also like Dr. Nurse and said, um, it has she has pretty much uniform thin walled cysts all throughout. So LAM would be the highest on the differential in terms of cystic lung diseases. And we sent off a VEG FD. Yep. Um, which is one of the serological markers of um LAM. And the other thing it, you can see with LAM is lesions around the kidney on, on yep. MRI. So it's another thing to look for. Smooth muscle perforation around the kidney, and you get um uh, these sort of uh, plasma masses type of around the kidneys. Well, so I'm not sure if she had one or not. Yeah. So we ended up doing a renal ultrasound at the time, um, yeah. again, to look for like renal um, angiomyolipoma. Right. Um, and that was negative. Sometimes LAM can also be associated with the tuberous sclerosis complex, um, but she didn't really have any other history. Um, and again, you may also see renal angiomyolipoma, uh, but her renal ultrasound was normal. Okay, um, but her VEGFD was high. So interestingly, her VEGFD had come back sort of months after she left um, because it's a it's a send out, um, and her VEGFD was in the inconclusive range. Okay. Um, so it wasn't super low, it wasn't super high. It was kind of in this um, medium range um, as to um, so with that you would have to use sort of your clinical judgment and imaging as supportive diagnosis. 
Yeah. Um, um, somebody's asking why she had a line pattern if uh, she had all these cysts. So yeah, um, Rhea is explaining it pretty well that that they don't make it out to the pleura. Um, I would still expect to see some some changes on her lung ultrasound. So I'm actually yeah. surprised that it was fully a line pattern with that extent of disease in her lungs. Uh, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me either. I would have expect to see <clears> some <throat> a line pattern and some loss of sliding in some spots, but it could be that the pleura was pretty preserved still, and this was really um, further in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, we were, again, very surprised at um, that workup initially as well. <clears throat> um, they're asking why you did a CAT scan um, or a test x-ray, because it's not indicated in pregnancy. I wouldn't say it's not indicated in pregnancy. I would say, you know, the risk versus benefit of everything. Uh, if her saturation is low and you have her dropping to the 70s with walking, then you really need to find out what it is because lots of things that she might have may be um, pretty lethal on her. So I think you need to you need to know what it is. So it's risk versus benefit. She's out of the first trimester. Um, you need to know what this is. You don't have any solid answers from anything else that you've done. So I think it's reasonable to say that you do need to do a CAT scan in that case. Um, yeah, we, we worked up everything short of all the non-radiation um, pathways and they were inconclusive. Um, yeah. And a CAT scan um, is a chest CT um, is actually considered safe to do um, in a pregnant woman if you need to do it. So yeah, and you put a lead, you put lead over the fetus and you, you do it, you do it that way. Um, treatment is serolimus uh, and someone's putting it in, in here and putting a different, nice differential in here as well. Um, yes. But uh, diffuse cystic lung disease, I would say for most of these things, they're not, they don't really look like this because most of these things have one cyst or um, a couple of cysts in one place, but not such a diffusely uh, beautiful pattern like this, where it's it's very much everywhere. The one thing I would say is Brit Hog du Brit Hog Dube would be in the differential here, um, uh, and something that I'd be worried about. But the rest of these things, most of them are um, not such a widespread distribution like this and and, and don't really look like this uh, at all. And Langer cells histocytosis, if she were a smoker, I would have headed in that direction, but you tell me clearly that she wasn't and no one else in the house was. So um, that wouldn't be it either. So um, I, in pregnancy, the treatment of this is gonna be a different story, um, but I know otherwise we treat with serolimus. I just don't know what that, if you can do that in pregnancy or not, I would have to look that up. But uh, what did you suggest to this lady in terms of treatment? Um, so you they, you don't use serolimus um, when in the pregnancy. So yeah. she had actually um, been referred to um, an outside institution that specialized in uh, LAMP and pregnancy and high-risk pregnancy. Um, initially, she was going to try to carry out her pregnancy, um, but actually by week 21, um, she started to become even more hypoxemic. Um, she got a lot. a lot sicker. Yeah. Uh, she was discharged on the hospital with two liters of nasal cannula on ambulation. And by the time she was um, towards the end of her second or mid second trimester, uh, she was requiring five liters. So she, she decided to terminate the pregnancy. We know the estrogen in the pregnancy is really harmful for this disease. And is a lot of times when people are diagnosed with, with this disease is right after a pregnancy or if they're going through IVF, a lot of times that this will pop up. Um, and a lot of the times the presentation is a spontaneous pneumothorax because one of these cysts will burst open and cause a spontaneous pneumothorax. And this is one of the differentials in this age group of a spontaneous pneumothorax is to worry about LAM um, as well. I had a patient yeah. present to me with this and her only symptom was dyspnea when she was having sex. And she was like, I can't have sex. Every time I try to have sex, I'm di I can't breathe. And her chest x-ray was normal. And when we did a CAT scan, um, it looked exactly like this. Um, uh, their PFTs are really interesting <clears throat> as well. Um, they have a low diffusing capacity. Um, and otherwise relatively normal for a long time, but the diffusing capacity drops pretty quickly because they've lost so much lung of normal lung volume with the with the cysts that you um, immediately are are looking at this very um, severely decreased diffusing capacity. I don't know what her hers look like her PFTs. Um, we we she did PFTs elsewhere. 
Okay. Um, so we, we then, don't have that, but we do know that her um, FEV1 was less than 70%. Okay. So that's kind of the cutoff between mild to moderate versus severe LAM. And so when you're in that severe lane, range um, or moderate to severe range, you should be started on serolimus. Yeah. So and then the eventually these patients really do get referred to transplant centers. It's one of the most common um, things to be referred to to for lung transplant would be would be for yes. LAM. And we think it comes back in the transplanted lung, right? So that's another problem. But yeah. um, it, there's really no, the serolimus is, is a temporizing maneuver, but it doesn't really reverse all of the disease that you see already. Right, exactly. The serolimus is there to stop progression, right. but it won't fix the cystic lesions that have already occurred. Right. Thank you so much for such a fantastic case. Maybe be, before we close out, Timbal, do you mind sharing just uh, two to three take-home points for everybody? Um, sure, absolutely. Uh, so I think, you know, the the point of this case was to um, approach a uh, pregnant female who's presenting with dyspnea on exertion. Um, the first thing, like I talked about earlier, was to figure out if this is physiologic dyspnea versus pathologic dyspnea. Um, hypoxemia is not normal. So if you have a hypoxemic patient, you really have to do your due diligence and do the workup. And I think, um, you know, when you're HPI, some of the things about the acuity of it, um, you know, prior medical history, um, hypoxemia, those kind of things are um, important to help lay out your differential. Um, common things being common, you should rule those things out first. So you guys had mentioned things like anemia, uh, we had mentioned things like cardiomyopathy and pulmonary embolism as well. Um, just of note, the CAT scan that was done was a CT angio um, because PE was still high on the differential given um, everything else was normal and that was negative. Um, and then in terms of um, LAM, I think just a couple of, you know, it's not a very common disease, um, but we do, we do come across it. Um, dyspnea is the most common presentation. So again, not every dyspneic person you have to screen for LAMP, but just to know that they're not going to present um, with, you know, necessarily specific findings. So dyspnea, um, spontaneous pneumothorax, as we talked about, that can be the presenting complaint um, in about a third of patients. Um, they can also present with pleural effusions, and that can be one way to um, help guide your diagnostic evaluation because you can get chylothoraces um, in patients with LAMPs. And, you know, the differential for chylothorax is not very big. So that can help um, hone in on your diagnosis. Um, and you should screen for tubular sclerosis complex. Um, you should check their PFTs. And really the only FDA approved medication right now is uh, serolimus. Um, and again, the reason why she probably presented now, even though these cysts didn't happen in 16 weeks, is because of the surge of estrogen, because lamb um, cells have estrogen receptors. And so um, when you have the surge of estrogen, it's going to lead to um, more prol proliferation and destruction um, and cyst formation. Very nice case. Thank you so much, guys. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.